picking up with Savalescu's argument where we left off. Remember, he's defending a view that he calls procreative beneficence. Procreative beneficence tells us couples or single reproducers should select the child of the possible children they could have who is expected to have the best life or at least as good a life as the others based on relevant available information. Available and relevant information, this pertains to genetic screening. Remember, Savalescu thinks that parents ought to eliminate disease genes, genes that predispose children to things like heart disease, neurological conditions, but also thinks that parents ought to screen for non-disease genes and pick genes that promote intelligence or good memory or those sorts of things. Now, it doesn't matter if genetics is not currently able to make those kinds of predictions. What Savulescu is saying is make a decision based on the best available information right now. If genetic screening can't check for good memory, that's fine, but once it is able to do that, parents ought to use that technology to make sure their children have good memories. In the same sort of way, parents should use the available technology to make sure their children are free from any sort of disease or chromosomal or genetic disorder. In this video, I'm going to be talking about lots of objections that have been levied against Savalescu's view. The objections that I'm going to be looking at, I'll just list them first and then we'll talk about each one. A worry is that genetic screening is going to potentially eliminate geniuses. Second, genetic screening, as Savalescu is advocating for it, the practice seems extremely discriminatory. Genetic screening harms people with disabilities currently. So people who are alive today with disability, they're harmed by what Savalescu is, is saying we ought to do. And it seems like Savalescu's argument is going to imply that genetic selection should be used to select for biological sex, in at least some cases. Regarding this first objection, so go back to how PGD works, embryo selection. You create a bunch of embryos via IVF, you check each one for different genetic conditions, and then discard the ones that are affected by the genetic conditions you're checking for. Those ones end up destroyed or used for research. An objector here might say, in choosing one embryo over the other, you might be discarding a person like Mozart. In other words, you might be discarding a genius of some kind. You could be discarding someone who's going to come up with a cure for cancer. In response to this, so suppose you select embryo A because it doesn't have any sort of genetic predispositions to anything that we deem to be bad, uh, and you discard embryo B because that embryo does have some predisposition to developing asthma, we'll say. In response, Savulescu says this, it's equally true that if you choose embryo B, you could be discarding someone like Mozart without asthma. A and B are equally likely, on the information available, to be someone like Mozart, and B is more likely to have asthma. What Savulescu is saying here is, based on the available information, for all you know, embryo A might be a genius, embryo B might be a genius, but you know that B has some negative attached to them that A doesn't. And so, if you want what's best for your children, you should pick A because that child won't face the same negative or potentially face the same negative that B would. And both have the same sort of chance based on what you know of being a genius. One thing Savulescu doesn't consider here is maybe the objector's point is that it's not a good idea to discard any individual human being because every individual human being might have the potential to become a genius or the next person who cures cancer. That, of course, is going to depend on what your view of embryos is, whether they count as persons, uh, and so that gets complicated. We can keep talking about that, but Savulescu at least anticipates this objection and, and gives a, a short response. I think probably the biggest or the most concerning problem with Savulescu's argument is that it seems to be extremely discriminatory. Take, for instance, an example that Savulescu himself writes. He says, consider a hypothetical rubella epidemic. A rubella epidemic hits an isolated population. Embryos produced prior to the epidemic are not at an elevated risk of any abnormality, but those produced during the epidemic are at an increased risk of deafness and blindness. Doctors should encourage women to use embryos which they have produced prior to the epidemic in preference to the ones produced during the epidemic. The reason is that it is bad that blind and deaf children are born when sighted and hearing children could have been born in their place. That type of claim will strike a lot of people as seriously offensive and problematic. Savulescu is literally saying that it's better for children without certain disabilities to be born than children with disability. 
that seems to be a pretty explicit case of discrimination against people with disability. But Savulescu doesn't think so. So here's what he says. This suggestion by the doctors saying you should pick the embryos from before the epidemic rather than the ones produced during the epidemic does not necessarily imply that the lives of those who now live with disability are less deserving of respect and are less valuable. To attempt to prevent accidents which cause paraplegia is not to say that paraplegics are less deserving of respect. It is important to distinguish between disability and persons with disability. Selection reduces the former, but is silent on the value of the latter. What Savulescu is claiming here is that screening technologies eliminate disability. Screening technologies eliminate those traits rather than individuals with disability. All that it's doing is ensuring that children that are born don't have disabilities. It's not saying individuals with disabilities should be eliminated. I think this is seriously misleading with respect to how genetic selection actually works. When it comes to PGD and embryo selection, for example, the way it works is you create a bunch of individual human organisms, you check each one for its genetic makeup, and you destroy the individual organisms that have whatever genetic makeup you're hoping to avoid. That doesn't cure or treat or eliminate a trait that eliminates the carrier of the trait. There's a difference then between changing an individual's trait. Somebody could go from being able to hear to being deaf. Somebody could go from being deaf to being able to hear. But they survive the change. That would change a trait. What Savulescu is advocating though is genetic selection, which in the PGD case, in the selective abortion case, what's being eliminated or changed is not a trait, you're not eliminating deafness, or you're not eliminating a predisposition to deafness. You're eliminating the carrier of those traits. And that's true whether you think it's a person or not. All this to say, Savulescu doesn't seem to notice the difference between an embryo that has a trait and the trait itself. If genetic selection were simply eliminating traits, then the carriers of those traits would survive the process but they don't. So again, a serious criticism here is that Savulescu is speaking in an extremely misleading way. When he talks about genetic selection is all about eliminating traits rather than eliminating individuals, that's just not how these technologies work. I'm going to move on past that uh, just for the sake of time, but we can talk about that in the comments. Another objection that gets thrown against Savulescu's argument is that genetic screening itself is bad for communities of people with disabilities that exist today. For one thing, genetic screening is going to reduce the number of people who are in those communities. If there are fewer and fewer and fewer people in communities of people with disability, then those communities might not have the same sort of political presence or influence. They might be pushed to the side or ignored. So genetic screening actually threatens the well-being of communities today. As Ronald Munson puts this type of objection, if disabilities become less and less common, researchers will no longer be motivated to develop new drugs or treatments for the diseases or disabilities that people now live with. So funding goes away, again, political power, political influence, and the communities themselves. By allowing genetic selection to occur on a, on a big scale, you're eliminating diversity of different types of communities. Another objection here, Remember, Savulescu's argument is all about trying to maximize the well-being of one's child. We can split this into two parts, though. What does it mean to try to make sure your child has the best life? If biological offspring count as child, then you obviously can't use PGD and selective abortion. Because if you have some sort of moral obligation to make sure your child has the best life, then discarding them or destroying them undermines their ability to flourish. We have to answer the question, do parents have obligations to their biological offspring? If the answer is yes, then it seems to apply to all embryos or all fetuses, regardless of whether they are, they're affected by genetic disorders or not. If a child has a serious genetic disorder, that doesn't change parental obligations to try to make sure that particular child has the best life possible. But Savulescu is talking about parental obligations in terms of having the best child, that's very different from saying you should do what's best for your child. So here, 
there's a huge distinction between doing what's best for one's biological children and making sure one has the best children. The second option, which is what Savulescu is promoting, allows individuals to completely neglect or destroy or reject or discard biological children. But if you think that parents have a moral obligation to, to see to it that their children, their biological offspring, have the best possible lives, then that applies to all biological children, those that have genetic disorders and those that don't. One more objection I'm going to consider here. Remember, Savulescu is talking about trying to maximize the well-being of one's children. What if you live in a society where members of a particular biological sex or members of a particular race tend to have better lives? In those societies, it seems like Savulescu's argument is telling us we need to make sure to screen for those sorts of variables. So for example, if you live in a society where people born biologically male tend to flourish more, tend to lead better lives, then Savulescu's argument says you should make sure that all of your children are male. That seems seriously problematic. But Savulescu responds to this concern. He says, in those cases, it's social institutional reform, not interference in reproduction, which should be promoted. What's wrong in such a society where men flourish and women don't is the treatment of women. Objectors here, though, like Elizabeth Barnes, are going to ask the question, why on earth wouldn't the same reasoning apply to people with disability? If somebody with a disability has a lower quality of life on average than people without disability, that's a problem with our social structures. That's something that has to change about the way our society is built. That's not an inherent problem associated with being an individual with a disability. So Savulescu is saying in the biological sex case, what has to change is the way social policy works. Why on earth think that that doesn't apply to disability as well? That's a question we're going to revisit when we talk about disability in this course. We're going to talk about different models of disability, whether disability is a biological feature of human organisms or if it's a social structure, it's related to social structure. Another serious concern here is that genetic screening communicates to people with disability that they are less valuable, that they're unwanted or they're unworthy of life or that they're not as important as people without disability. Against this too, Savulescu is going to try and say it's not people with disability that are less valuable, it's the traits themselves that we're trying to change. But again, this just ties back to that other concern that Savulescu is being very misleading about how this technology works. Genetic screening when it comes to PGD and embryo selection as well as selective abortion is not simply changing traits. It's eliminating carriers of traits. When it comes to these sorts of discussions, genetic screening and what that says about disability, we need to take seriously the testimony of people with disability. People who say, my life is not negatively affected at all by having a particular disability like blindness or deafness. Remember again, Savulescu said quite explicitly, it's bad that children with disabilities like deafness and blindness are born when children without could have been born. How does that come off to people with disabilities? That's something that we need to take very seriously. We need to ask that question. We need to ask what their view is of this. Because when it comes to flourishing and well-being, what Savulescu might be doing is importing his own idea of well-being and ignoring what other people have to say about their own flourishing. So people who are deaf, people who are blind, if they say that they're living happy, flourishing lives and Savulescu is saying deafness and blindness undermine flourishing, who are you going to listen to here? And the answer seems pretty clearly not Savulescu. On this same sort of note, I'm just going to leave off with one last thought. Jeff McMahon notes, it's usually only people who have not had a disabled child who are averse to doing so. Those people who have actually had a disabled child tend overwhelmingly to be glad that they had the particular child that they did. He continues, this very different evaluation of having a disabled child by those who have actually experienced it is no less rational and no less authoritative than the evaluation that many people make prospectively that it would be bad or worse to have a disabled child. In fact, he says, these two viewpoints are equally valid evaluations. So what he's saying here, notice that parents who have children with disabilities tend to view that as a positive thing. 
they tend to be overwhelmingly glad that they had the children they did. On the other hand, you've got people who are thinking about the possibility, who don't actually have children with disabilities, they're just thinking about what would it be like, and they see it as a bad thing. They say, I wouldn't want to have a child with a disability. Mick Mahan is saying that these are two equally valid, equally authoritative views. But think about this in other contexts. So suppose you want to know how difficult it is to climb Mount Everest. You've got two different people that you might ask. So you want to know how difficult is it to climb Everest? What kind of training does it require? Is it a rewarding experience? Is it worth it? Is it a positive experience? You want to know this. So you've got two people that you can ask. One named Jones, who has climbed Everest, who's already done it. And another named Smith, who never has, who's just thinking about it. Just thinking, maybe one day I'll climb Everest. Is it the case that these two individuals, Jones and Smith, have equally valid views when it comes to what climbing Everest is like? And the answer is obviously not. If you want to know what it's like, if you want to know how difficult it is, if you want to know if it's rewarding or worth it or whatever, ask the person that's been through it. It makes no sense to say that people who are thinking about what it might be like have an equally authoritative view as those who have actually been through it. The same sort of thing applies in the case of children with disability. If you want to know what it's like, if you want to know whether it's a positive or negative thing, ask the people who have experienced it. All that to say, what Savulescu is advocating is using genetic screening to try to have the best child. We've looked at what his argument is for that. We've also now considered lots of different concerns that might arise when it comes to genetic screening. I've done just kind of a quick overview of these concerns. Because of that, we're going to need to keep discussing these in our online discussion board. So I encourage you to ask questions, raise comments. Um, if particular objections need more unpacking, or if you thought I was being unfair about something, let me know. We're going to keep talking a little bit about genetic screening. We're going to talk about gene editing in the next video. And then we're going to move on to a discussion of disability generally. So a lot of the topics that I've talked about in this video, I've just touched on really quickly and moved on. In the meantime, here are some sources you can look at if you're interested in continuing to read up on genetic screening and the issues surrounding it.